All right, welcome back to The Apologetics of Jesus and Paul. This is session six, our final session. And so uh, very bittersweet for me and maybe for you as well, but definitely for me. I really enjoyed our time together getting into God's Word, talking about how Jesus defended the truth. And today we're going to look at somebody a little different. We're going to look at the Apostle Paul. And this is... The passage that we're going to look at tonight is the quintessential passage. When people think about famous apologetic encounters in Scripture, this is the one. As a matter of fact, until recently, this was the only definitive apologetic passage I could have named for you before I really died. I, I always had the sense, yeah, I think Jesus did apologetics as well, but I knew Paul did apologetics, and it was Acts 17 that I was thinking of. So this is it. We're going to get into it, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Real quick, if you don't know about the Think Institute, we are an organization, a teaching ministry, founded on the belief that no Christian should ever get caught flat-footed when asked what or why we believe. And so we equip believers to explain, share, and defend the Christian message. And we've got resources for children, for students, and for adults. Right now, I'm working on some really exciting stuff for students coming up for this upcoming school year, 2021. All right. So let's get into it. This story, which is a true story, when I say story, don't don't hear me on don't hear me wrong on that. Okay, this is a true account, something that happened. It's historical, but we're going to call this one the Mars Hill Red Pill. Now, some of you are hearing that Red Pill, you know exactly what I'm talking about right away. But uh, others of you, I'm going to have to explain that. That's perfectly fine. First, let me just tell you, we're talking about Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. Acts 17, 16 through 34, the Mars Hill red pill. Okay, what is a red pill? What does it mean to red pill, uh, to, to red pill someone? Um, to red pill someone is to wake him up or her up from the delusion that they were in to true reality, often harsh reality, harsh, cold truth. It's to red pill is, or to get red pilled is sort of like the, um, right of center or conservative version of becoming woke. You know, on the left, they have getting woke. Definitely not going to use that. But um, red pill is uh, is sort of the, the people on the right use that a little bit more. So in this episode, of course, that's a reference to the matrix. In this episode, Paul is going to red pill the philosophers of the court of the Areopagus, these philosophical elites there in Athens. He's going to awaken them to the harsh reality that there is only one God despite their plethora of idols and that they cannot avoid him despite their attempts. So this is the Mars Hill red pill. All right, key questions for today for you guys to keep in mind. Question one, how did Paul prepare for his apologetic encounter? You know, for us, we think about getting out there and doing apologetics, engaging with people. Sometimes we get really excited about it. Other times it's like, man, I feel flat-footed. I feel unprepared. But we're going to look at how did Paul prepare for his apologetic encounter um, and hopefully draw some inspiration from that. Then we're going to look at question two. Question two is, how did Paul use the Athenians' ideas against their worldview? That should sound very presuppositional to you right now. You've been studying that presup with us. You know about presuppositionalism. How did he use their ideas against their worldview or against their foundational presuppositions? And then question three we want to take a look at, I want you to keep in mind, is what objections today or worldviews today are similar to those of the philosophers there in Athens that Paul encountered? We're going to look at some, some really fun, I think, comparisons and parallels between the Apostle Paul and the people that he interacted with and the people that you and I are going to interact with on a daily basis. So right now we've got some guys watching backstage. Guys, if you have questions, you know what to do. Just drop them in the chat or write them down and we'll get to your questions at the end. Okay. Our story opens with a setup. Here we are. We're in Athens and the Apostle Paul is not yet on the Areopagus. He's in town. He's waiting for his friends. And while he's waiting, that's when things are going to start heating up. And, and that's, how, that's what's going to kick off our story. So this starts in verses 16 through 18. And there's a little bit of the setup in verse 21 as well. 
This is kind of a long passage, so I've broken this one up into two slides. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he observed the city was full of idols. So he was discussing in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. And even some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. And some were saying, what does this babbler want to say? But others said, he appears to be a proclaimer of foreign deities because he was proclaiming the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And then we skip ahead to verse 21 here. Now, all the Athenians who stayed there, used all the Athenians and then all the foreigners who stayed there, used to spend their time in nothing else than telling something new or telling something or listening to something new. And the word there in the original language is newer. So that's verses 16 through 18 and 21. Now, a couple of philosophical schools were mentioned here. Let's break them down. Let's talk about them. The first one is the Epicureans. The Epicureans were followers of a philosopher who by this point was deceased, but his name was Epicurus. And Epicurus founded this school, but his followers were basically functional atheists, functional materialists. They acknowledged that there was a higher power, but they denied that this higher power had any oversight in their lives or any uh, providence or any sovereignty. They believed that the universe came about through the fortunate confluence of material causes, kind of like a modern day Big Bang cosmology, materialist cosmology. They did not believe in the afterlife. They believed that um, uh, uh, they, they did not believe in the afterlife. And th for them, their highest good was pleasure. Their highest good was pleasure. Um, I believe they they believed in an eternal future, so the the universe would just sort of last forever. Now, their founder Epicurus was not a hedonist. However, by this point in the first century, his followers, the Epicureans, were basically sensualists. They were basically hedonists, and I don't mean like John Piper. Um, Christian hedonism. I'm talking about the the other kind of hedonism, the bad kind of hedonism. Um, now, the Stoics, they were different. They were pantheists, which means they believed that God was everything or everything was in God, which is more panentheism, but either God is in everything or everything is God. That's, that's better. They were fatalists. They believed in fate, the unseen non-interactive, impersonal force guiding the world, guiding the universe. They believed in cyclical history, and they also believed in no immortality. The reason why is because they believed that the universe was ongoingly going through these cycles of confl conflagration, so being burnt up, and then rebirth. And they didn't see any way for the soul to persist throughout that process. So the Stoics believed in no immortality, and they placed a strong ver uh, emphasis on virtue. They believed that because God is everything and everything is God, um, the best way to live was to be in harmony with nature, harmony with the world. And so, whereas for the Epicurean, pleasure was the highest good, for the Stoic, neither pleasure nor pain was good or bad. They focused on virtue in the face of both pleasure and pain. But one thing they all had in common was they always loved to hear about new stuff, new things, new news. So uh, the, the, uh, the Athenians were addicted, really, to new ideas. And again, that original word in the original language is newer. They wanted to know not just what's new, but what's newer. In fact, we now know through the study of history that what they really wanted to know was when they were asking about what's new, they were asking, what's the newest thing since the last new thing that I heard? They wanted to know what's new, newer, and newest. Now, you might notice some parallels to our own society here. When we meet someone that we haven't seen in a while, we greet them, not by saying what's good, but we, some people do, but typically we ask, 
What's new? We want our products new and improved, and we want to keep our eyes fixed, glued to the news. We're always watching the news. So we have a lot in common with the first century Athenians. And what Paul was doing was he was reasoning in the synagogues with the Jewish people and the God-fearing Gentiles who would have been worshiping at the synagogues. But then he was also going around in the marketplace talking to these Athenians. And some of those Athenians were these philosophers, these sort of philosophical elites. And his evangelism was about to create an apologetic opportunity for him. As often happens when you share the gospel, oftentimes there's pushback, and then that leads us into an opportunity to defend our faith, to engage in apologetics. So we get to our challenge then in verses 19 and 20. Here's what it says. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we learn what is this new teaching being proclaimed by you? For you are bringing some astonishing things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. So here's Paul's apologetic challenge. They're basically saying that Christian teachings are fascinating, they're worth listening to, but ultimately they are strange and probably unconvincing. Remember, it seemed to them like the apostle was proclaiming strange deities, foreign deities, because he was talking about Christ and the resurrection. And so they thought he was proclaiming some new God named resurrection, or in the Greek, anastasis. That's the Greek word for resurrection. So they thought he was talking about Christos, Christ, and anastasis, resurrection. They thought that these ideas were interesting, but probably peculiar, strange, and probably wrong. Now, let me just remind us again about our three-step apologetic method. This is our three-step presuppositional method. Step one, we do an internal critique or a reductio ad absurdum on the unbelieving position. Step two, I'm just buzzing through this because we already know this. We do an internal critique of the biblical position. I don't say we do a reductio because you cannot reduce the biblical worldview to absurdity. That would kind of put a hamper in our apologetics, I think. And then step three is the call to repentance or the evangelistic appeal, or as we saw oftentimes in Jesus' apologetic, it's the strong rebuke, shaming them for not believing the truth. So just keep this in mind because we're going to see Paul using these three steps, but remember the three steps aren't always used in the quote unquote correct order. All right. So now we get to Paul's response. How does Paul respond to the challenge that's been put his way? Here's what it says. So Paul stood there in the middle of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing carefully your objects of worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. That's verses 22 and 23a, meaning the first part of verse 23. Now, what's Paul doing here? He's respectful to them, but he's not flattering. When he uses that term, very religious, in the original language, it's a very ambiguous term. On the one hand, it can mean pious and devout and worshipful. On the other hand, it can also mean highly superstitious. The former has a positive connotation, the latter a very negative connotation. And the question is, I, I, when you read different commentaries, you get different answers as to what Paul was going for here. On the one hand, Paul wouldn't have been so rude as to go in to the Areopagus, which, where he's basically being put on trial. This is something in between uh, a friendly meetup gathering and a straight up trial. This is somewhere in between there. But Paul wouldn't go into that esteemed court of the Areopagus and just come out guns blazing and insulting them. We know that when when Paul was in Ephesus, he didn't blaspheme the goddess Diana, even though the goddess Diana is not a real god. Paul was able to later on say, look, we didn't blaspheme your goddess. Paul had this mentality, this approach when he went into foreign cities with foreign deities, where even though he had no problem showing why that false worship was false, he didn't do so in a way that they would have considered to be blasphemous insulting or um, uh, unnecessarily offensive. So there's a good lesson there for us. So 
He's probably not just coming out saying, you guys are a bunch of superstitious wackos. On the other hand, it was actually against the law to flatter the philosophers at the Areopagus before you gave your defense. So he's probably not going in there to flatter them either. And it's interesting, Greg Bonson, the 20th century apologist, um, he thinks that Paul is using a term that is purposefully ambiguous. Just to keep them guessing, what does he mean here when he says very religious? So he's respectful. He's not flattering. He may be acting a little bit ambiguous on purpose. Later on, he's going to show that while they are very religious, they've been misusing their religion. So very important. Um, He's also, now this is answering one of our first questions. Paul has been carefully observing their objects of worship. He's prepared himself. He's been walking around the city and he wasn't just taking a nice Sunday stroll. He was observing their objects of worship, noting the details, reading the inscriptions, and gathering information so that he could reason with them. Now, he didn't necessarily know he was going to the Areopagus, but if an opportunity were to present itself, Paul wanted to be prepared. And what he noticed was that there was an unknown God inscribed on one of the um, on, on one of the altars. Now, history tells us there were probably several of these altars to unknown gods. And it's a little mysterious as to why they had that. Some think that it was just sort of an overabundance of caution, we might call. It's like, hey, I'm worshiping Zeus and Athena and uh, Apollo, but you know what? There might be some God out there that I didn't know about, and so I'm just going to worship an unknown God just in case, covering my bases. It might also be because 600 years prior to Paul being there, a plague had broken out in, I believe it was in Athens, and it was Epimenides, I believe. Maybe it was in Crete, but there was a plague. And um, one of the, I want to say it was Epimenides, one of the uh, philosophers, it's recorded that he ended the plague, ended the pestilence in this way. He offered sacrifices of sheep to some god, uh, some anonymous god. And that god stopped the plague. And so that may have been where this tradition of worshiping an unknown god came from. They wanted to give this god tribute and thanks for stopping the plague because none of the other gods could do it. So that does kind of sound like our god a little bit, doesn't it? But wherever this altar came from, whether it was one of those altars from 600 years ago or whether it was a new one, the fact is what it signifies is that they have enough knowledge to know that there's an unknown God, but not enough knowledge to know or not enough knowledge to identify him or describe him or offer him any other kinds of worship um, or even to acknowledge if this unknown God is really above and beyond the other gods or to inquire as to how he might rightly be worshiped. So they're stuck in this contradictory schizophrenia, Greg Bonson calls it, where they're claiming knowledge and ignorance about this God. And Paul's going to highlight that and really push them on that later on. Basically what he's doing here is the Apostle Paul is holding up a mirror to their religiosity and their self-professed agnosticism about God. He's, he's highlighting their current state. He's like a doctor diagnosing their current religious state. Okay, so moving right along then. He then sets them up for his apologetic approach. This is not one of the steps. This is just a, a, this is Paul's own setup. Here's what he says. Oh, actually, you know what? This is this is the next step. He is moving on to, to a step here. This is verses 23b through 27a. He says, Therefore, would you worship without knowing it? This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all the things in it, this one, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives to everyone life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of humanity to live on all the face of the earth, determining their fixed times and the fixed boundaries of their habitation to search for God, if perhaps indeed they might feel around for him and find him. So here's Paul's response now. And in case you couldn't tell, this is step two. He's jumping right to step two in our three-step process. What's he doing? He is 
boldly proclaiming biblical truth in a way that they can understand. He's directly challenging Stoic naturalism and Epicurean uh, Stoic pantheism. And remember, they believe that God is in everything, or uh, everything is in God. And Epicurean naturalism, which they just primarily believed in the physical world, atoms. What he's showing them is they have a culpable ignorance, meaning they're ignorant, but it's not the kind of ignorance that you can just brush off and say, well, I didn't know I was never told. This is a culpable ignorance. Why? Because according to what Paul is saying here, God has predetermined the boundaries and the times and the locations where each person would live so that God has perfectly arranged it so that they would be well-suited to find God. God has not made himself too hard to find. And because of that, because they don't know God and they're still worshiping this unknown God or calling him an unknown God, they are ignorant but it's a culpable ignorance because God is not hidden. God is not hard to find. Now, they had accused Paul of proclaiming strange deities, but here he says, this I proclaim to you. He's proclaiming to them, using the same word, the true God that they should have already known. He actually uses a cognate there. It's, it's a very similar word. They accused him of being a proclaimer. He says, I'm proclaiming. Um, Paul also speaks authoritatively and biblically even though this is a non-Jewish audience. Now, if you were to go and look up Isaiah 42, verses 5 through 8, Greg Bonson points this out. Paul is following the format that Isaiah lays out in those three, those four verses. He, he talks about how God gives life and breath and how God sets people free who are groping around in the darkness, as in, in, in a, a, a dark dungeon and that God's glory should not be shared with idols. It's exactly the same format, or pretty close to it, that Paul uses here. So Paul is is taking his scriptural worldview, his biblical worldview, and he's sharing it with this non-Jewish audience who never read, uh, never read Isaiah, never read the Torah, never read the prophets, but he's doing it in a way that they can understand. And he's speaking authoritatively, he's presenting this authoritatively, even though they don't share his worldview. That's very surprising. A lot of people think that you need to not use the Bible, not use, not appeal to biblical ideas um, as if they're authoritative, biblical claims as if they're authoritative. When you're dealing with non-Christians or people who don't have a scriptural worldview, man, Paul just blows that notion out of the water here. He's got his worldview and he's sticking with it. It's very interesting too that Paul also quotes from Stephen, the martyr, whose death he approved back in Acts chapter 7. If you, if you compare these two speeches, Paul is quoting um, Stephen. I believe it's when he says, God made from one man all the nations on earth. And so it just goes to show you the incredible transformation that Paul has uh, undergone, where he's now quoting the guy that he helped to martyr. Okay, moving on to the next section. Now we're going to get into where Paul goes to step one. And indeed, he is not far away from each one of us, for, for in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Therefore, because we are offspring of God, we ought not think the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human skill and thought. So Paul here is quoting Epimenides, a philosopher, and Eratus, who was a poet. He quotes Epimenides. Maybe your Bible has quotes around this or not, but up there where it says, in him we live and move and exist, or maybe your translation says, and have our being, that is actually a quote from Epimenides. And both Epimenides and Eratus, who says, for we also are his offspring, now, they were talking about Zeus, not God. And so Paul is quoting them, and he's not, he's not quoting them as though they are philosophical authorities or religious authorities. Sometimes apologists get that wrong. They say, see, Paul is um, saying that the Greeks, you know, they got this right. They stumbled onto the truth. That's not what he's doing. What he's, he's not quoting them as an authority. 
Instead, what he's saying is their false religion has elements of truth in it, and it derives its power off of those elements of truth, but it is perverted and corrupted. And so that's what false religion does. There's a reason why there's so many false religions out there. And people say, well, they all teach the same thing. Well, they don't, but they have many of the same similar elements to Christianity, biblical Christianity. And it's those elements that give them their strength and their power. If it was all just falsehoods, nobody would believe it because it would seem too absurd. But because what what these false religions do is they mix truth with error, they have strength, but then they still lead people astray. It's kind of like having nine out of the 10 directions you need to get to somebody's house. You're missing that one turn and it's going to throw you totally off course. What Paul does here then is he proves that the creator God could not be physically limited like idols. He says, look, you guys know that there is a transcendence to deity that cannot be accounted for by your idols. In him, we live, move, and have our being. In him, we we live, move, and exist. Paul's not affirming panentheism or pantheism here. Instead, what he's saying is, um, in him, it really means by him or by his power or thanks to him. So what, what he's saying is, look, you understand that your very existence is derived from deity, that there is a transcendence to the deity. And here you are worshiping these statues, these silver and stone statues. So he's showing the contradiction in their worldview. You know that the, the, that the transcendent is real. You know that God must be transcendent. Why are you worshiping these false deities? Why are you being so contradictory? You can see why Paul's spirit was so grieved within him as he's walking around Athens. So he shows them that they know more about the unknown God than they admit. And he even said at the beginning, he said, what you worship in ignorance or, or uh, without knowing it. Um, he's calling them out on their ignorance and, and teaching them the truth and showing them that they really should have known the truth already. Then Paul goes to a solid step three. Here's what he says. Therefore, although God has overlooked the times of ignorance, he now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed, having provided proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. Acts 17, 30 through 31. Oh man, I love what Paul is doing here. Paul is putting them on straight up blast. Paul is giving them both barrels at this point. Here's why. Paul's talking about the resurrection from the dead. He's talking to to a people who openly scoff at the idea of a resurrection in the epicenter of resurrection denialism. Here's what I mean. There was an ancient legend that said that when the Areopagus was founded by Athena, one of their gods, goddesses, Apollo, another one of their gods, declared, quote, when the dust drinks up a man's blood, when he dies, there is no resurrection, end quote. That was a declaration by one of their supposed precious gods on that spot, on the Areopagus, when the Areopagus was founded. That's part of the Areopagus's foundational myths. And here Paul is proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. So that's one way that he's hitting them. The second way he's doing it is he's contradicting the cyclic, um, the cyclic history of the Stoics and the eternal view of history of the Epicureans, because he's saying history is going to have an end. Uh, there is an afterlife; the soul does persist after death, and uh, and one day we will all be judged by a man, by Christ Jesus, on a particular day that God has appointed. So he's already shown them that their worldview is inconsistent. Now he is calling them to repentance functionally by teaching them the gospel. Well, what's the gospel? The gospel is that Jesus Christ died for sinners, rose again, according to the scriptures, and Paul's taking them a a step further and bringing them to this eschatological truth, this end times truth, that there will be a day of judgment and that it'll be Jesus who does the judging. God is going to judge by Jesus. Jesus is the perfect man. What a standard. So Paul is giving a solidly biblical appeal to Christ's authority in this Areopagus, which was was a hotbed of 
false God authority and philosophical authority. And then he is essentially calling them to repentance, not even essentially. He is specifically calling them to repentance. He says, God himself calls all people everywhere to repent. All right. So what was the result? Here's the result. Now, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, guys, they reacted exactly as you would expect. Some scoffed, but others said, we will hear from you about this again also. So Paul went out from the midst of them, but some people joined him and believed. Among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So there are three responses from Paul's audience. As often happens, Paul is interacting with a second party, but it's the third parties who are most impacted. This is why we love to watch debates, because we're not in the debate ourselves, but we get to sit back and either be encouraged or convicted by what the debating partners are saying. So what we find out is these third parties, some of them scoffed at resurrection. What are you talking about? That's insanity. We thought you were talking about some goddess named Anastasis. Now you're telling me that, um, that uh, you know, An- Anastasia, now you're telling me that there's an actual resurrection going to happen? No way. Others were intrigued and wanted to hear about it again also. Now, that doesn't mean that they were saved. It doesn't mean that they won't be saved. But there is this sort of religiosity that tries to hold God at a distance by saying, I'm neutral towards God. I'm interested in God. I'm a seeker without actually repenting. Paul didn't say, God is calling you to seek and look into these things further. He said, God is calling them to repent. But they're not quite ready yet. But then that third group, which includes Dionysius and Damaris and others, These people believed, and what happened? They joined with Paul. There's this public joining with Paul. They're now on Paul's side. They're no longer on the side of the Stoics or the Epicureans or the philosophers or the idolaters, but they're joining up with Paul. So we can expect this when we evangelize. We can expect these three different results. Now, who are some modern-day Epicureans and, and, uh, and who are some modern-day Stoics? Okay. Let's start with the the Epicureans. The first group of Epicureans are the woke. Woke Wokeism. Why do I say the woke are modern day Epicureans? Well, because the Epicureans believed that the body was a sort of prison for the soul, a prison for the spirit. Now, the woke might not have an express belief in a spirit, but part of their ideology, critical theory, um, uh, whether it's critical um, race theory, but really I'm thinking more along the lines of uh, a transgenderism, the, the transgender wing of, of wokeness. I know I'm not using all the proper terms, but go with me on this. They believe that you can be a male born in a female body, that your gender can be different from your biological uh, external reality and internal reality, biological reality. They believe that, therefore, that the authentic self is disconnected from biology. There's this internal authentic self. And I remember I asked a um, a member of the uh, Equal Rights hmm, Campaign, Human Rights Campaign, that's what it is, who um, their symbol is is a a, uh, yellow equal sign. And he approached me on the street and was talking about transgenderism and, and how they need more rights. Um, and I asked him, I said, so how does this work? Uh, how is it that, that, that internally they can be male and externally female? Is it, is it their spirit that is different? Like God gave them the wrong spirit kind of thing. And he thought about it. He'd never thought about it before apparently. And he said, yeah, I, I guess so. I guess they were born with the wrong spirit. So this is this idea that the body is a prison for the, the, the soul, the authentic self is imprisoned in this body. And, and the woke would say that it's possible to be imprisoned in the wrong kind of body. Um, they also emphasize this world as opposed to the afterlife. They believe that you must have justice in this world. So they march through the streets and they protest and they riot and they give in to uh, uh, sensual uh, sensuality and whatever um, urges they might have. Why? Because they have to pursue satisfaction and justice and um and self-actualization in this world because, you know, the afterlife is downplayed if the afterlife is going to happen at all. 
and I'm not trying to paint with too broad of a brush here, but I kind of have to in order to, I have to paint with somewhat of a broad brush in order to talk about these different movements. Um, the, 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 the pride parades we see in the street, it's, you know, outward sensuality and, um, sort of a, a celebration of this, you know, Epicurean hedonism gone wild. Okay. So these are the modern day Epicureans and I'm putting them all under the category of woke wokeness. Um, wokeness is a new term. Wokeism is a new term, but, um, you might call it leftism or, or modern day Marxism, whatever you want to call it. It's all under that umbrella. Okay. The second group that's your modern day Epicurean is your atheistic materialists. And you can see the, the symbol there that is the, with the, with the, the bug eyes. If you're looking at the video right now, there's the bug eyes and then those spaghetti tendrils coming down. That is the flying spaghetti monster, which is their fake deity that they claim to worship. Um, that was sort of a new atheist thing about 10 years ago. It was like this really smarmy snarky thing that they would do. Um, but ultimately what they believe is the universe has no cause, no meaning science will eventually answer all of our questions. And we focus on this life. You need to live a good life in, in this life, but ultimately, you know, um, good and bad, good and evil are relative. And, you know, one thing we, we know we don't want is any, um, of those Christians cramming their worldview down our throat. Uh, but heavy trust in science and then heavy belief that the material world is really all there is a very Epicurean in that regard. What's our goal in dealing with these groups? Um, well, we need to be respectful. We need to show honor and, and reverence just as Paul did. And just as Peter instructs us in first Peter three, um, just as Jesus did, but we also need to show how the values of justice, the value of self, the value of science aren't materially based. A value can't be based in changing matter for it to be unchanging, unchangingly good. See, the woke and atheistic materialists do have values that they hold to, but but it's they also have this sort of um, agnosticism, um, sometimes even bordering on nihilism about the world. They don't know. They believe that science, uh, atheists would say, we believe science will provide the answer. We don't know now, but we know that science will eventually come through. So there's this deep rooted not knowing this, this deep rooted ignorance, much like the Epicureans of Paul's day. What about modern day Stoics? Um, this one's going to hit a little closer to home. Uh, this is your Jordan Peterson followers. And um, why do I say that? And why on earth do I have a lobster there as the icon? Okay. Um, once, as I was studying up on stoicism, it came right to me. I mean, Jordan Peterson and uh, Jocko Willink and, uh, you know, that sort of wing of the intellectual dark web, if you will. I don't think Jocko is part of the intellectual dark web, uh, maybe the jujitsu dark web or something. But, um, but this idea of virtue, of, of doing the right thing, even in the face of adversity. And then get this, okay, sorting yourself out, obeying 12 rules for life, and then 12 more rules for life. So there's 24 rules for life. The idea that there are these Jungian archetypes and structures that are built into our collective consciousness, our collective mind. Are uh, uh, you know in th these are these are things that are intrapersonal structures that go back, um, even including uh, biblical ideas, which Peterson believes that the Bible was kicked up over you know thousands of years, it's sort of a re reflecting the best of humanity, but it, it didn't it wasn't given from God; it was kicked up from our collective humanity. These ideas are true; these archetypes are true, but. They're true and valuable because they're ingrained in humanity through evolution. So it's a very bottom-up approach. And so for, for Peterson, it is important to be virtuous. It is important to sort yourself out, clean your room. But it's rooted in these, these archetypes, which are ultimately rooted in our uh, evolution, supposed evolutionary ancestral past. And Peterson talks a lot about the lobster in his book, 12 Rules for Life. He talks about, and so this idea of lobsters uh, being associated with Peterson is, is you know, kind of lighthearted, but, um, but this is what he roots his ideas in.
So what's our goal here? And, and listen, I believe that there's a lot of good in Peterson's thought. I also, um, so I, I'm not playing neutral between, you know, uh, the, if, if it's the modern day Epicureans or the modern day Stoics for me, you know, I'm going to lean more towards modern day Stoicism. Um, just like I think ancient Stoicism had a lot of good in it. Um, more so probably than, than, uh, ancient Epicureanism, but, um, but they, they still need to repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that hasn't changed. So what's our goal in, in dealing with modern day Stoics? We need to show how virtue and how rules for life reflect truths that come down from on high, from above us, not from below us. So we should never take the glory of God who has revealed truth to us and give it to a lobster and give, uh, so to speak, give lobsters God's glory. Look, these truths, these archetypes, they don't come from Jung. They don't come from our evolutionary ancestors like lobsters or apes. They, they come from God. You don't need to appeal to evolution. Evolution is not even true. Uh, macroevolution, neo-Darwinian evolution is not even true. We shouldn't go low for truth and meaning. We should recognize that um, truth and meaning come from God. And to the extent that we have any truth and meaning, we recognize the transcendent. We recognize that there are archetypes. We need to see that that um, those archetypes, if they exist, if they are truly there, they are they are from God. The knowledge of those is 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 a gift from God. And all we can do without God is pervert and corrupt them. So that's our goal when dealing with modern day Stoics. Now, one last final objection, just because this is our last session, simulation hypothesis. What if we're living in a simulation? I've had people give this to me as a sort of, a, they thought it was an objection to, um, to God or to Christianity. How do we refute the simulation hypothesis? Now, if you are really interested in this, my brother Parker has a great article. It's my, it, it's actually the most popular article, I think, on the Think Institute website. If you go to thethink.institute, you can check it out. Um, I think it's simulation theory debunked or simulation hypothesis debunked, something like that. We also did a podcast episode on it. But how do we refute it like Paul? Well, any, any there, there are different ways of doing it. But um, if we're going to try to do it like Paul, here's how I think we might do it. Any simulation is going to rely on mathematical and logical truths, logical values, logical propositions. Now, these truths, these propositions are necessarily true in all possible worlds. So even if our world is a simulation, even if there's this unknown designer out there, sort of like the unknown God who's sort of pulling the strings, um, there must be mathematical and logical proofs, uh, truths rather, propositions in order for a simulation to, to work. There must be necessary truths. Now, um, here I'm indebted to the work of James Anderson and his recent conversation with Cameron Bertuzzi on the Capturing Christianity uh, podcast. You can go check out uh, Cameron's interview with um, with James Anderson. But he talks about how if there are uh, necessary propositions, necessarily true truths, then really this is this is uh, my argument. A simulation. If we're living in a simulation, all that does is just push the question back one. Because what kind of worldview makes sense of these necessary truths? Well, I argue that it's the biblical perspective, the biblical worldview that makes sense of logic. The logic presupposes God. I won't get into the whole proof right now, but logic and mathematics and uh, morality, these all presuppose the biblical worldview, the biblical God. Well, the biblical worldview says we're not living in a simulation. So repent and believe the gospel because that's the biblical worldview. So we can we can argue against simulation theory like Paul. There's other ways of doing it as well. Um, I don't quite follow my my brother's argumentation on that, but I think my argument works as well. Uh, you can let me know if you think otherwise. Okay, so those are some modern day versions of Paul's approach to this unknown God theory. Um, at this point, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you guys for watching. And um, I, you know, I really hope that this 
course was helpful to you. If you want to know more about the Think Institute and how to partner with us, you can go to thethink.institute or um, you can go to give.crew.org, C-R-U.org slash 1018841. Or if you search for my name, Joel said a case or my wife's name, Elisa said a case, um, you can find us on there. But that's how we are funded. We're funded by like-minded individuals who partner with us, who appreciate our work. And some of some of you guys are already partnering with us, and I deeply, deeply appreciate that. Uh, others of you might want to prayerfully consider that. If nothing else, please be praying for the work that we're doing. And uh, thanks for taking part in this class. Okay, that about wraps it up for this episode. The Think Podcast is a production of The Think Institute and is produced by yours truly, Joel Sedekes. The Think Institute operates under Church Movements, a ministry of Crew under the division of Crew City. To learn about how to support The Think Institute and my family tax-free, go to thethink.institute slash partner. I hope you heard something helpful today. I know I did. Remember, this is not goodbye. This has just been a short stop on the journey as we learn to lead our families in defending the Christian message. And we'll see you next time. Until then, I hope it made you think.